1990's Sinjanor presents us with something of an oddity within the film world. You see, usually if a film is popular, makes a lot of money, or a studio has so much faith in the idea up front, it'll be granted a sequel, or maybe even some kind of extended life as a TV show, see Ash vs the Evil Dead or the recent Chucky TV series. But when Scared to Death was released in 1980, it made money, but it didn't make enough money to get studios interested. It garnered something in the way of public interest, but only about enough to render it a bit of a cult classic. And while studios did have some interest in the idea of a Scared to Death sequel, none of them were willing to put up the money up front for it. Or, in the one instance where they could have made it happen in 1985, the creator of the film, William Malone, was unfortunately tied to another project. As such, because distribution for the film was handled by a relatively small company, they weren't able really to penetrate the home video market, itself awash with similar low-budget features, and as such, the film kind of fell into relative obscurity. That is, until the late 80s, when producer Jack F. Murphy managed to catch Scared to Death and pretty much instantly fell in love with the idea of the Syngenor, synthetic genetic organism to you and me. It really felt like the creatures could be used in so many more different and interesting ways, and so he set up a meeting with William Malone to explore the possibility of producing a sequel and getting William on board to direct. Unfortunately, William once again had his hands tied and couldn't free himself up to take the project on but he gave Jack his full blessing to produce his own movie with the Syngenor, and even offered to help reconstruct several costumes and variants as part of the process. As time went on, Jack slowly began to get a little nervous about the project. He was concerned that the original movie was so low budget compared to more modern features, and so obscure given its limited release, that they'd be shooting themselves in the foot making a direct sequel to Scared to Death, because audiences probably wouldn't have even seen the first one, probably couldn't see the first one, and would be put off at the thought of jumping in on the second entry in a potential franchise. So, Jack decided to instead completely distance his film from the original, cutting all references to Scared to Death and making a completely new movie that just so happened to feature the Sinjin Orb more or less exactly as they were in Scared to Death. How did it work out? Well, the film follows Susie, the niece of an acclaimed scientific genius named Ethan, who up until recently was working for a big tech and weapons manufacturer called Norton Dynamics. Norton have a bit of a dirty secret. On their books is a project called Operation Dark Skies, which was an experiment to create the ultimate super soldier who was indestructible, needed minimal food and water, was super strong and agile, could reproduce asexually every 24 hours, and could survive in extreme weather conditions. This creature was the Syngenor, and as the film opens we see two swaggering blokey dickhead sorts leading some ladies of the night down into the basement of Norton Dynamics to show off all the cool weaponry and weird shit that's out of the public view in the hope of getting the ladies excited and possibly scoring themselves some bouncy bouncy. Unfortunately, while down in the basement, one of the women spots a giant tankard and on looking inside she spots a Syngenor in stasis. She's terrified, but the guys try to settle her down. That is, until the Syngenor breaks free of stasis and kills both the women and one of the blokey cocks before heading out of the building to presumably go on a bit of a spree, with the only survivor being a business exec called Dan who promptly flees the scene. We're then formally introduced to Susie, who's caught a lift back to her uncle's house with a guy who's quite keen to be invited into the house for a coffee and a chance at something more than coffee. Susie's not keen, however, and politely declines before heading inside. Out back in the garage, Ethan is working on a new chemical that seemingly makes oranges explode, and that's about it. Anyway, that's not important, really, because within moments of us being introduced to him, a Syngenor appears, murders Ethan, and lays an egg in the corner. Meanwhile, back in the house, Susie gets in, realises that the power's been cut, wanders outside, finds her dying uncle who says something about watering the pod before carking it. She then gets jumped by the Syngenor. There's an extended chase sequence through the house, but Susie manages to get away and heads over to the nearest police station. Susie stays at the station overnight, and in the morning she's greeted by Leo, one of the lead officers and a good friend of the family. Susie explains that her uncle was seemingly murdered by something inhuman and Leo tries to dissuade her before attempting to get her back to the house. 
Meanwhile, back at Norton Dynamics, a plucky upcoming journalist by the name of Nick has just wandered in, hoping to grab an interview with the company's CEO as part of a wider piece he's doing on the company. The secretary there is a sucker for brown nosing and lets slip that a murder has happened on the site in the last 24 hours. But just before Nick can get his scoop, Dan appears and escorts Nick off the property. Before leaving though, he manages to get one piece of information. That the day before the murder, our top scientist Ethan handed in his notice and left the company under slightly mysterious circumstances. Nick leaves and it's here that we're introduced to our core baddies for the film, as a stakeholder meeting takes place at Norton Dynamics to discuss what had happened the night before. Obviously we've already met Dan, but joining him is a lady that Dan has been in constant communication with up to this point called Paula. The pair are trying desperately to climb the corporate ladder and they think that they're about to sweet talk their way into a cushy top of the tree roll working under the CEO, Carter. Carter's a bit… odd. Not in any way that's specific, just in an unsettling, eccentric way. He also self-injects himself chronically with what looks like reanimator fluid, so… there's that. Anyway, Carter leads the meeting explaining the circumstances of what's gone on. He establishes the Sinjinor and explains how Ethan was key to their creation. They talk about last night's murders, and Carter explains that he's been in touch with the authorities and told them to downplay or dismiss anyone coming forward claiming they've seen a Sinjinor, as they're classified for the time being. A specialised security team have also checked through the facility, located any eggs that may have been created and stored them away in stasis. Once the meeting's complete, Dan and Paula head outside and Paula suggests that, since one's gotten out and still hasn't been recovered, it might not hurt to release all of the Sinjinor and either create a scandal or have them inadvertently murder all the top stakeholders. Meanwhile, back in the suburbs, Leo manages to get Susie back to her house and tells her to head in and get some rest. She does, but she's curious about seeing the garage for herself one more time. So. She heads out back and immediately spots someone or something hiding under a blanket. She grabs a knife, approaches with caution and reveals… Nick? Who for some reason that's only barely explained, found out Ethan's home address, headed over there, broke into his garage and started reading his private journals. Then when he heard Susie come in, he hid under a blanket in plain sight like a literal three year old. Susie's not playing around and pretty much threatens to gut Nick, but after some brief backing and forthing, tensions cool down a bit. The pair bring each other up to speed with their separate stories and after Nick explains about his article, Susie decides to grant Nick full access to all of Ethan's work on one condition. That he include in his article a section at the end telling the world exactly how Ethan died and about the Sinjinor. Nick agrees and is subsequently informed that he's been granted an interview with the CEO the next day. While this is going on, back at Norton Dynamics, Dan asks the secretary on the main desk to head down to the basement to run some checks. Inevitably, while down there, she's attacked and murdered by Sinjinors. Dan heads down a short time after and almost immediately finds her dead body, which apparently surprised him for some reason, followed by him narrowly escaping being attacked by Sinjinor himself. 11am the next day, Nick and Susie arrive at Norton for their interview. They're greeted by Dan, who offers an initial pre-interview with Nick, during which Dan explains what Project Dark Skies is, while Susie sneaks off to go and explore the facility while trying to find any clues about the Sinjinor she can. As luck would have it, she manages to find a room set up for presumably potential buyers into the Sinjinor project, which gives her a full breakdown of everything, including a life-sized one in stasis right next to her. While this is going on, Paula reveals to Carter that Dan has caused the death of the secretary, who was also Carter's niece. He doesn't seem massively bothered though, he seems almost totally out of it. While this is going on, Susie gets spotted by security, who pick her up with the intention of taking her to the CEO, but not before stopping in front of a display for the Death Rattle, a sonic cannon weapon that packs a seriously powerful blast. The meeting with Carter is incredibly brief, in fact he literally hands Nick a pre-written article that puts the murders and weird goings on down to a disgruntled employee and tells him he has little to no choice but to publish that, and that he won't get any more information out of himself or any of the other employees here, and that if he does push on with trying to expose anyone or anything about the company, the cops will be paying him a visit. 
Susie is then brought into the meeting and both of them are escorted out of the office while Carter calls an emergency stakeholder meeting. And this really leads us into the final act, as Nick and Susie swap stories and decide to sneak back into the promotional room to get some photographs and Carter decides to announce an end to Project Dark Skies and the eradication of the Singenors, it's a race against time for Nick and Susie to solve her uncle's murder, safely destroy the Singenor and take down Carter and the demented members of Norton Dynamics. In a game of thrills and spills, will Nick and Susie beat Carter? Will the Singenor escape the facility and take over the world? And why make it a point that the Singenor survive off drinking spinal fluid if you aren't actually going to show or even vaguely demonstrate that? What a waste of a cool gimmick. I don't know. All this and more will be answered if you check out Singenor. And honestly, though it pains me to say it, I just didn't really get on with this one. It was initially requested to me by a viewer, but I just found too many problems with it to really truly ever get into it. For a starters, the script is kind of a mashup of 23% references and ideas lifted from Scared to Death, 66% references and ideas lifted from Robocop, and 11% actual original ideas. Norton Dynamics as a company is basically the OCP, complete with tense and sometimes gory boardroom meetings, pissing contests amongst the employees, and even feel-alike characters, with Carter largely mirroring the old man from Robocops 1 and 2, Dan and Paul are essentially sharing the duty of being a mashup of Dick Jones and Bob Morton, and Susie and Nick kind of filling in for the roles of Murphy and Lewis. The Singenor are basically Ed 209 or the Rebel Robocops from Robocop 2, and given that Robocop 2 came out in the same year this film did, the fact it ties itself so closely to those movies isn't exactly surprising. But it did massively disappoint me, as I was hoping to actually have something resembling an original story here, not just something that felt knocked out over a long weekend, a six pack of beer and a trip to Blockbuster. Given the intention of the film was to give the Singenor a decent platform to possibly launch a franchise from, it was beyond disheartening to see that they'd basically just retooled elements of the plot of an existing film and slapped a Singenor sticker on it. The pacing is a bit all over the place, with a hearty amount of padding helping to just about push this film into feature runtime territory, there's a hell of a lot of repetition or just moments where our characters will sneak into somewhere, get caught, get removed from the place only to sneak back in a few minutes later, there's a lot of pretty pointless conversations between Dan, Paula and Carter that don't really add anything to the plot. The padding doesn't ruin the film per se, though the third act does end up a bit of a crawl for a while until the gang finally figure out what needs to be done to resolve things. And because it's basically stole its story from Robocop and Scared to Death, it means that tonally it's kind of left without a voice. There are moments where it's incredibly melodramatic, times when it's often overly serious, and times where even it seems to be a bit lost as to where it wants our characters to go. And because it's constantly swapping in and out of these styles, it creates a very lumpy and tonally uneven presentation. I was never quite sure exactly what the film wanted me to think or feel about it, if it had lent even a smidge more into the self-aware, dark humour, Robocop style of shenanigans, it'd probably have had a significantly cleaner cut voice. I'd have basically considered it a full-blown knockoff rather than a film heavily lifting from another movie, but at least it would have been clear. Had they toned down the humour and decided to go for a more horror-driven edge, again, I'd have probably had an easier time breaking things down. But as it stands, because it kind of just does whatever it thinks will keep the audience watching, it never really defines itself beyond its ties to other movies. This issue was only compounded by the fact that the producers, writers and director have gone all in on the Singenor, like they're supposed to be the next Cabbage Patch Kids or Pogs or something. Don't get me wrong, the Singenor are a pretty cool and fun little idea of a wee beastie, a creature that's almost entirely indestructible that lives on spinal fluid and can reproduce asexually every 24 hours that looks like a sleeker, more agile version of the creature from the Black Lagoon is a pretty neat concept. But there's a way to play these things, and here they are totally not cool about it. Every character who can talk about or refer to the Singenor does so at least half a dozen times each. There's barely a scene that goes by without someone mentioning how powerful or unstoppable or scary the Singenor are. It's almost like they wanted to establish some kind of brand identity for the Singenor, without actually having any kind of branding or merch opportunities for the Singenor. I can't imagine a world of Singenor plushies, baseball caps, trainers, lunchboxes. But this was clearly a world the producers thought was viable, 
It's incredibly annoying from a writing standpoint and it did make me lower my expectations for the picture quite a bit because of it. On that subject, the dialogue isn't too great either. It's all very stilted, awkward, it doesn't flow naturally or feel particularly realistic. It's very melodramatic and I'm struggling to figure out if that's because the writing itself is crap, in my opinion, or whether they were trying to do that melodramatic dark humour style of dialogue that's present in Robocop. But because they aren't Edward Neumeyer or Michael Miner, that quick-witted, sarcastic and charismatic lampooning of 80s culture, tone and intelligence just isn't there with this. In either case, the end result feels like a script that's almost a parody and exactly half as endearing as one. The script was written by Brent V. Friedman. He has 33 writing credits covering a pretty decent range of genres, including video game credits for Halo 4 and Tales from the Borderlands, and work on some full moon properties such as Pet Shop or, probably most infamously, he wrote Food Fight. I hope that helps establish the tone with this one. On directing duties we have George Alangian Jr. He has 15 directing credits largely for TV series and adult features, including the Playboy video magazine specials, Candid Camera and How'd They Do That? And on the direction front, well, it just about does the job. I would say George seems to have worked with the teams to produce an end product that's good enough to cut the mustard in the low budget film arena. But that's about the highest praise I can give it. There's a certain cheapness to some of the designs, looks and feels in this production that just kind of took me out of the experience. Moments where it felt like they'd done enough but hadn't quite gone above and beyond. Stylistically, this thing looks and feels pretty flat, dark and drab. I appreciate that 1990 was hardly the most colourful year on record, but a lot of this film lacks anything in the way of vibrance or a director's zeal. It's all pretty much shot for function, with heavy emphasis on coverage with a muted colour palette pretty much strangling the film before it even had a chance to walk. When the fact that the Singenor eggs glow a reddy orangey colour is the only thing I can comment on in terms of your stylistic vision for the picture, you know that something's gone a bit amiss. Same goes for the cast as well. I don't know, for the most part they seem to have understood the brief, it wouldn't have surprised me if they'd just made the cast watch Robocop in prep for this thing, because everyone seems relaxed in their spaces and they work with the dialogue as best they can, but there's a lot of moments where the cast seem a bit unsure of what to do in their set space, or are maybe in a place where they're unsure of how much experimentation they can or can't get away with. Like. There are some moments where they really go to town with props and full movement, where it feels like maybe the director had had the time to really work out a plan with the cast in order to get the best out of them. But then, in the same breath, there are moments where a cast of three or five people will be bolted onto the spot with a deer in the headlights look about them, with the implication being that if they don't get the scene nailed here and now, it'll be the last scene they ever shoot. I don't know, it just feels like a bit of a mixed bag that was likely caused by a tight schedule, low budget and high tensions. The cine doesn't fare much better, on the one hand, for the most part it looks filmic. Shots largely utilise appropriate blocking and compositional choices, I didn't spot any instances of the line being crossed and it looks like they've really aimed to make this production look as studio grade as possible. On the other hand, a lot of the shots here look incredibly flat profile, there's almost no depth of field present and because of the aforementioned muted colour range, it means that scenes that were already struggling with lacklustre scripting and spotty direction had to deal with a near total lack of an eye for compositional flair. While it does have a few moments that genuinely surprised me in terms of nice shots, and I absolutely won't go as far as to say this film is dead behind the eyes, from a cine standpoint it does rather feel like a film running on autopilot. I don't know, had the lighting and editing maybe been a bit more solid this might have turned out differently, but as it stands the lighting, much like the cine, is pretty flat profile. There's little to no use of coloured lighting gels and when they are used I personally didn't feel they were used all that effectively instead largely being used to create a sense of artificial atmosphere, which it fails to do, or to just try and make the shot look cool, which it also fails to do. The editing's a bit choppy as well. I mean, I'd go as far as to say it's passable, but because they didn't really bother to experiment with the cine, it's left the edit a bit high and dry in terms of what it can cut to and from. As such, it's a bit basic, and in some cases there just isn't really enough there to play around with to create an engaging narrative which does rather kill both the pacing and the engagement for me as a viewer. Performance wise, on the whole, it's a fairly muted range. Star Andreef and Mitchell Lawrence as Susie and Nick are basically trying to play a hybrid of Lewis and Murphy pre-transformation from Robocop and Ted and Jennifer from Scared to Death. 
charismatic but with a slightly harder edge. And that's fine, but because I don't feel like they were given much of a decent well to draw from on the script front and given their characters aren't really all that well defined, it feels like they essentially just had to crack on with whatever they were given, which means I don't really feel these guys got a chance to grow into their characters. I don't really see it as a good sign when I'm watching someone play a role and I think to myself, realistically I could envision almost anyone being able to play these roles and it not be dreadful. That's a problem, because if your characters are one size fits all, it means they're not going to stand out against any of the other cast members. Which unfortunately is the case, as the vast majority of the supporting cast here are basically all in the same boat, all playing hybrids of characters in the style of either Robocop or Scared to Death with no variation, no development and poorer dialogue than either of the movies they're sourcing from. Which really doesn't do the film any favours. Honestly, the one shining reason to check this film out, the thing that pretty much made the 98-ish minutes somewhat worthwhile, was David Gale's performance as the CEO Carter. At first he does play this thing a bit like the old man from Robocop, but as the film goes on the character's mental health slowly starts to deteriorate until, by the third act, he's full on Looney Tunes, jumping around like a madman rambling inanely and cutting through scenes like scissors through wrapping paper. I don't know how much Gale was paid for his appearance in this film, but it definitely needed a couple of extra zeros added to the end of it for just how much energy he puts into playing this absolute maverick. He's a clear standout in this for me by a country mile. And finally, the soundtrack. It's honestly pretty unremarkable. A generic mishmash of late 80s synth stings for tense moments and very early 90s Muzak style lighter pieces for the more mundane parts of the picture, it's lacking any real kind of solid impact and basically is only here because playing the whole film out in total silence would somehow be worse. But little to no thought was put into how this thing sounds and it really shows. Sinjinor seemingly didn't get a VHS release in the UK when it first came out in 1990. In fact, the first release I can find on UK shores is a DVD release from 2002 by Prism Leisure. By this point, the picture quality for the release isn't too great. I noticed a ton of artefacting and, for some reason, on my setup the picture looked overly sharpened. If I had to hazard a guess, it looks like they basically just went back to the master they used to dub the original US VHS release, pulled that, cropped out any picture issues and shoved a sharpen filter on it before kicking it out the door. To add insult to injury, there are no special features either, just the film and a scene select, which is a bit of a bummer. Sinjinor was an interesting idea in principle. Take a monster from one movie and transfer it wholesale into a completely different movie with none of the original continuity to back it up. Outside of the monsters from novelizations, think Frankenstein or Dracula, it's something that just isn't really done in contemporary films. Unfortunately, because of the fact the script is so hamstrung, combined with fairly by the numbers direction and cine, the only thing I can take away from this thing is a feeling that they kind of wanted to do a sequel all along, couldn't logistically make it work and then lost interest but still had to make a movie regardless of the circumstances. In my opinion anyway. As a result this thing feels rushed, lifeless and largely cribbed. Of the two, I'd personally say stick with Scared to Death, but if you've watched that one and really liked it, you may get a kick out of this film. The only reason to check it out otherwise would be if you're curious about David Gale's performance, but honestly if you're not that bothered about that, I'd say give this one a swerve.